Picture this. After years of personal growth, your 10,000 hours of practice, and an unwavering yet exhausting dedication to promoting your music through superfluous short form content, the blood, sweat, and tears all become worth it as your debut studio album is released to rave reviews, chart topping songs, a terrifyingly dedicated fan base weaponized to the point of doxing any dissidents at a moment's notice. Fame and glory and adulation are all yours. Now what? This debut release was the culmination of decades worths of built up emotions and experiences and condensed into roughly 10 to 20 songs are the integral components of your life, the things that make up you. After such an emotionally intense labor and the resulting success, you feel more fired up than ever to get back into the groove of making music for your next record. But where do you really go from there? The sophomore slump, also known as the sophomore curse or syndrome, is a phenomenon where breakout artists find difficulty in replicating what made their initial sound so successful, and as a result, produce an artistic output and follow-up album that is generally agreed upon to be uh, unfocused, low quality, generally worse. There are a lot of potential factors that play into and produce such a situation, and honestly, what even qualifies as a sophomore slump uh, could be argued upon as well. Does it really only refer to relative commercial failure despite critical favor? Does it refer to a glaring drop of quality despite maybe commercial success? Does it have to be both or even a mysterious third thing? I suppose that's what we're here to find out, and I hope that with some observation of a couple albums that I've handpicked, audiences tend to assign this label, we can reach a conclusion that helps us better understand the phenomenon in the first place. Because breakout and rapid success producing overnight celebrities is an interesting occurrence that really only happens more frequently as the music industry becomes more accessible to budding artists. It feels like every week now we collectively discover a new single that takes the nation by storm, and if that song drops on Monday, then by that Friday the artist has gone from local talent to 10 million monthly listeners in a late show guest spot. It happens so often that I think it's pretty easy to overlook just like how absolutely insane that is, how, how fast we produce celebrities and the density of the growing famous person population. And since the collective audience of pop culture thrusts artists into a national spotlight without really any hesitation, we see strange and backwards examples of artistic growth. Flo Millie released her first commercial lead single in 2019, and then she played at Rolling Loud the same year. We don't even really give people time to process that they're famous anymore. For some artists, the stars perfectly align, and instead of years of grueling grassroots promotion and opening slots at house shows, one day they wake up and a song that they made that was no different than any other song they had made previously uh, has made millions of plays overnight and has a corresponding TikTok trend. Whether or not the artist properly capitalizes on this sudden and exponential growth is a whole other beast that determines the longevity of the newfound fame they now possess. But just in terms of observing initial virality, we produce more celebrities than we really know what to do with. And inversely to my interest in rapid overnight celebrities, I also have a great interest in their equally rapid downfalls. Not because I'm like an awful person and revel in the failures of those more successful than I am, but rather because such intense shifts in a career trajectory are not only wildly captivating, but I also believe that they reflect on the audience just as much as they do the artist. And if we dig through the details of sophomore slumps and mismanaged fame and, and poor decision making on a case by case basis, then we can sort of derive larger implications about the relationship and dynamic between artist and audience as a whole, and how each party plays a role in the success of the art. And before we get too far, in the video, I feel like a clarification is in order. I, I say this before every video, I, I just want to make sure my intentions are clear, so bear with me. Although we will touch on a specific level of virality that sort of takes form and acts like the Island Boys, Lil Tay, and those guys at the separate extremes of the next size spectrum, that's not really the sort of downfall we're talking about here. Uh, I, I'm not really interested in that when it comes to this topic. There's a pretty massive difference between talented and popular artists losing grasp on a once seemingly invulnerable level of fame, and someone that operated under a type of popularity that was kind of always based on them being the butt of the joke, going viral for people pointing and laughing at them, not because of any actual perceived quality by a committed fan base. No offense though. Someone squandering their 15 minutes of fame isn't really the same, uh, but since it is sort of uh, tangentially related, we'll touch on that later on.
And speaking of, where I do believe there are multiple factors that play into a sophomore slump and similar concepts, especially given how accessibility to music has evolved over time, we will assign each point to a sort of vague timeline of events using examples from different eras of music to argue for the effectiveness of each cause of what some could refer to as a fall off. Because an artist in the 1990s experiencing their label mismanaging the success of their debut record, putting the success of their anticipated follow up in jeopardy, that's a much different sophomore slump than an artist in 2024 hitting unseen levels of overnight virality and being entirely unprepared for what comes with that sort of like meme-like status, what that entails. But both produce the same end result, being somebody that for a fleeting moment seemed to be on top of the world and due to unforeseen factors fell from that great height. Get comfortable and let's travel back to the 1990s, 1996 to be exact. The year is 1996, Twister is out in theaters, Tupac gets shot, and Democratic incumbent Bill Clinton is re-elected president. I'm sure that will have no following consequences. It's an interesting year for music in releases and in drama. Snoop Dogg is acquitted of first degree murder, Phil Collins leaves Genesis, DJ Screw records his 35 minute long June 27th freestyle, and LA indie rock sensation Weezer releases their anticipated sophomore album Pinkerton. Guys, be cool about this, we're gonna talk about Weezer for a bit, it's gonna be chill, I'm doing something here, just bear with me. The album came to be after the band scrapped the concept of a rock opera called Songs from the Black Hole, a project in which I can only imagine the vastly different trajectory Weezer would have been put on should it have been released. Pinkerton is a pretty interesting moment in Weezer's extensive history and will be our first example of what could reasonably be referred to as a sophomore slump. The album was primarily written by lead vocalist Rivers Cuomo and the lyrics and themes are fueled by a series of pretty low moments in his life following the success of Weezer's first album. The first being that he had surgery to balance the length of his legs as one was significantly shorter than the other. This surgery and the following weeks of physical therapy pretty much put Cuomo out of commission in terms of songwriting and general music making for weeks on end as he spent most of his time uh, hospitalized and unable to walk without assistance, not to mention the necessity of high painkiller usage. At the same time, he studies to apply at Harvard University due to his decreasing interest in the rock genre, sort of feeling disillusioned with it and feeling limited by the conventions of the sound. And not just the sound, but the whole lifestyle as well. In his admissions letter, he says, you will meet 200 people every day, but each conversation will generally last approximately 30 seconds. Then you will be alone again in your motel room or you will be on your bus in your little space trying to kill the nine hours it takes to get to the next city, whichever city that is. So the monotony and impersonal lifestyle of the genre that founded Weezer's breakout success had gotten to him. So as he continued to write songs, a new, more emotionally abrasive, bleak, and edgy sound began to form out of his frustrations with his health and his career. The rock opera Songs from the Black Hole was scrapped and Pinkerton was born. The album was a commercial and critical failure on release, receiving at best mixed reviews and the number three spot on Rolling Stone's readers worst albums of 1996, a highly coveted position. Also, a much different reception than the multi-platinum debut record. So, why? Well, we'll start with this concept. Today, Pinkerton is a cult classic and generally regarded as a pretty good album by diehard fans and even casual listeners as well. So if today's listeners recognize it as a quality entry in the lengthy Weezer discography, why did it flop back then? Why was it a sophomore slump? Out of the three general reasons for such an occurrence that we'll kind of be getting into in this video, this is the first and probably the least complicated, being that Pinkerton just sounded different. Weezer's debut self-titled album was a surfy pop punk record that delivered on playful introspection and sort of anthemic summer tracks. It was a little dorky, but also comfortable in that identity. Songs like Buddy Holly and Say It Ain't So were catchy and just punchy enough to leave an impact. In an era of grunge domination, Weezer felt like a safe haven for awkward teenagers and nerds everywhere. So when Pinkerton comes along, many people are looking forward to another round of bright summer anthems with a bit of edge to keep it cool. It wasn't necessarily a bad album, but expectations are tricky things. As I'm sure you could guess, poor reception of a record due to subversion of expectations is not exactly a new thing, it's pretty common, and often produces a short-term aversion to the album by fans of the musical act. Another massive one that comes to mind for me is Pretty Odd by Panic! The Disco, one of my favorite bands from when I was in middle school. That's not a dig at Panic! The Disco, just a fact. I was an eighth grade in 2014, so by the time I had gotten into Panic, they had already kind of gone through a record-breaking number of stylistic changes from emo to folk to baroque pop to electronic, and the newly solo Brendan Urie was now experimenting with big band. By this point, that was just the precedent that they had set. But way back in 2008, Panic! at the Disco had the reputation of being this sort of cool, kind of emo gothic band in a way. So a retro-fueled folk pop release coming out of nowhere was incredibly divisive for even the most fervent of fans. Like Pinkerton, that album is now pretty critical 
critically acclaimed and fans adore it, but that's really only in retrospect. And that's not to say the album flopped, it actually went platinum, but relative to a fever you can't sweat out's triple platinum status, it was quite the commercial downgrade. The list goes on, there's heaps of albums that just didn't live up to the success of the previous due to the preconceived notion of what it should sound like. You know how I said earlier that sophomore slumps can reflect on audience behavior just as much as the artists? This is where that comes in, so pay attention. We, as humans, struggle with change. We, uh, we react poorly to it in many cases. Rosabeth Cantor wrote an article for Harvard Business Review that sort of outlines different reasons somebody may have a negative reaction to change, and although we sort of typically view these changes through the lens of career changes, divorce, accidents, financial problems, you know, real shit, I do think that they give us an insight into why audiences dislike when their favorite artists drastically, or even only slightly, change their sound. The first listed reason is loss of control, which actually makes a lot of sense, especially when you consider how emotionally connected people get to their favorite music. If a band is a sort of music musical lifeline for somebody's most emotionally vulnerable moments, then a dramatic shift in that sound could make a listener feel as if that connection has been severed, leaving them emotionally stranded without the supporting tether of a band they once found comfort in. Even if that music isn't necessarily emotionally visceral, it can still act as a life raft and an open sea for somebody who enjoys it. It sounds dramatic, but I'm serious. I mean, people find an ardent and intense security in their favorite music, and if that changes, it strips them of the projected identity that they have placed onto the band, losing control of what grounded them. Cantor also points out that a sudden surprise change throws people off because of their unpreparedness to change with something. If an artist drops an album that is a brand new sound, a departure from their previous sound with no warning, it can shock people and turn them off to the idea of ever listening to it in the first place because they didn't get to slowly walk into the shallow end of the pool, they were pushed off the diving board in the deep end. That shock leaves a bad taste in our mouths and if we don't get the time to change, we won't. Cantor also points out that we're creatures of habit, which is true. We rely on routine and familiarity to balance our lives and bring us stability. So, if my favorite band releases a playful and upbeat surf rock album and then follows it up with a raw, underproduced, jagged rock record about isolation, lack of identity, and a romanticization of Eastern culture, it would probably throw me off balance a bit. So take that and put it in the context of a much greater scale. It makes sense that albums like Pinkerton or Pretty Odd weren't commercially viable, not because of the quality of the records, but the shift in content. Good albums that came out at inopportune times functioning awkwardly in the context of their release. And although I believe examples like these reflect an odd and, and kind of almost selfish dynamic between artist and audience, it's not really anyone's fault. No one's at fault for this. It would be unfair to tell 1996 Rivers Cuomo that he should refrain from writing about his most visceral and painful emotions because that doesn't line up with an audience comforting consistency he must adhere to. And it's also not fair to tell an audience they're close-minded or snobbish for not appreciating a change in sound. Both parties get something different out of the release of a record, so it's up to them to decide which metric of success they measure by. Does it suck that Cuomo's vulnerable meditation on his most visceral moments went underappreciated at the time? Yeah. Does it suck that a portion of Weezer's audience felt let down and aimless in their feelings for a band they love? Also, yeah. These things just happen, and the resulting consequences are things like sophomore slumps and future cult classics. Risk taking is called that for a reason, and you don't always know what's gonna happen. So was Pinkerton a sophomore slump? Yeah, sure, but it's also more than that. But what happens when experimentation or change in sound isn't the cause for a sophomore slump? I did say I had two other reasons. Let's move on to the next one. This one is a bit tougher to tackle than the previous point because logistically there's so many moving parts. Albums are massive and labor intensive undertakings with a lot of gears grinding to make the machine turn and not just creatively either. There's producers, marketing teams, label and executive oversight, in some cases multiple writers, budget analysts, a legal department. And not only for like major mainstream global phenomenon like Drake or Taylor Swift, most artists have to jump through at least a couple hoops to ensure that their album rollout is executed as smoothly as possible. And such is life, the more components there are involved in the process of creating something, the more likely it is for something to go wrong somewhere along the way. Every step of the process must be completed with a meticulous and tactful work ethic, or everyone involved might run the risk of falling flat on their fucking faces. This is an especially tricky process for new breakout artists on the come down of experiencing an explosively successful debut record. Because as I'm sure you could guess, an album rollout for an artist like Drake or Taylor Swift is highly methodical by this point, down to a formula their respective labels can sort of replicate with ease ad infinitum. And this is because once an artist has an established career spanning years 
years of recognized positioning in the music industry, you don't really have to worry as much about losing traction of the initial momentum you have to expertly ride when first starting out, given you've by this point developed a consistent and dedicated fan base that already supports your art. Taking the proper steps in managing an artist's newfound success and producing workflow to effectively maintain it to keep the momentum going is the most important part of a musician's career, like number one. As Dre says on Wesley's theory, anybody can get it, the hard part is keeping it, motherfucker. Although some of you may contest her perceived quality, Ice Spice is a pretty fantastic recent example of maintaining momentum after a viral boom. Her song Munch exploded in 2022, especially on TikTok, and it blowing up isn't really what was important to her career. It was, it was nice and it was a good starting point, but the next steps that she took to efficiently capitalize it on, are, that's really what's important. Because a seemingly random song from a lesser known artist blowing up on TikTok isn't exactly a novel experience. In fact, it happens so often that it's kind of become a, a bit of a meta for budding artists and bands seeking to uh, find a quick and low effort way to achieve stardom. Did I just make the song of the summer? That's right. I'm I'm bringing pop punk back. Goth Dami Mommy. So Munch blows up in August of 2022. Ice Spice then signs to 10K Projects, whose parent company is Warner Music Group. This is a notable signing from a label that has more or less proven its success. Ice Spice is the talk of the town. Her infectious Bronx drill is taking the world by storm. So what does she do? Well, the stars align a little bit. She gets a co-sign from Drake, securing a play on his Sirius XM station. She delivers another viral hit in the form of Bikini Bottom, and then she releases her debut EP while the ball is still rolling and eyes are still on her. She also secures a couple feature spots that keep her name in the conversation with Lil TJ, Pink Pantheris, and in April secures herself a Nicki Minaj feature. Things are looking up. And to cement herself as a figure in hip hop and pop culture that plans to stick around for a bit, she features on a Taylor Swift song, you know, the biggest pop star in the world, and then has a song on the Barbie movie soundtrack. You know, the biggest movie in the world. That's not too bad for somebody whose entire personal life has been boiled down to being a bisexual resident of New Jersey. And sure, you could argue that a lot of her or anybody else's success could be attributed to a terminal case of right place, right time. But that doesn't change the fact that it worked out. When you hit such a monstrous level of virality like she has, every single decision that comes after can make or break a career. And even if I don't love her music myself, I'm impressed to see her maintain relevancy when I really didn't expect it to go as long as it has. But what happens when that doesn't go as planned, when an artist on the cusp of superstardom, whether by their fault or somebody else's, loses grasp of that prospect of longevity? Let's talk about Roddy Rich. And honestly, if I didn't self-impose specific parameters for the nature of this video, uh, I would probably talk about the baby. But unfortunately, he doesn't quite fit the definition of a sophomore slump specifically. So before we talk about Rodney Richard, I can't help but take a momentary detour to indulge in the baby's highlight reel a little bit. Which, after some unprompted and, and wildly homophobic remarks at the 2021 Rolling Loud, include but are not limited to a cancellation of his appearance at Lollapalooza, a subsequent G Herbo replacement fashion brand Boohoo Man cutting off their collaboration with the baby, being removed from the Governor's Ball Music Fest lineup, removal from Park Life Festival, Day in Vegas, Austin City Limits, Music Midtown, and the iHeartRadio Festival as well. Radio stations started playing a version of Levitating that omitted his part in it. A legendary fall off etched into history for sure. In another world, I would have loved talking about it. But back to Roddy Rich, who probably presents a more nuanced and interesting situation anyways. Roderick Wayne Moore Jr., a professionally known as Roddy Rich, is a Compton rapper who broke out in 2018 with his single Die Young. The success of the song brought in a new audience that helped feed the streets one and two, uh, two mixtapes that he released in 2017 and 2018 respectively, receive a pretty, a pretty widely positive reception. He kept his name in the conversation with a Grammy winning rap verse on Nipsey Hussle's song Racks in the Middle and a popular verse on Mustard's Ballin' as well. Capitalizing on the success, he signed to Atlantic Records and his debut studio album is a pretty anticipated project from a rapidly increasing fan base. The album's post-release single, The Box, was a massive, and I mean absolutely massive, massive success. I was in college when the song released, and it was pretty much played at every single party, social gathering, and shindig in town. I mean, this track had rural West Virginians everywhere sporting their fanciest boot cuts and mud stompers two-stepping like Trump was back in office. Roddy Witch- <laughs> Roddy Rich's debut studio album, Please Excuse Me For Being Antisocial, released to a first week equivalent of 101,000 equivalent album units. Not too shabby. Actually, the opposite is shabby. Uh, that's, that's really fucking good. 
It's a double platinum record that broke the record for the longest running number one debut rap album with 50 Cent's Get Rich or Die Trying being the previous record holder. So things are looking up for Roddy Rich. What could possibly kill his momentum? Well, like literally any other artist would, Roddy Rich quickly gets back into the studio for his sophomore album. And in August of 2020, while still on the high of the box, he announces his next album and in September of 2021, reveals that it is titled Live Life Fast. The follow-up record has features from Future, Kodak Black, 21 Savage, Take Off, Jamie Foxx, Ty Dolla Sign, Alex Isley, Fivio 4, and Lil Baby Gunna and Baby Borelli. It also featured production from Kenny Beats, Wheezy, Southside, and over a dozen others. Talk about a stacked lineup. With some tenacity and determination, this was almost a pretty much guaranteed success, continuing to confidently ride the wave that Roddy Rich's debut album started. So after one single in the summer of 2021, Live Life Fast is released December 17th, 2021, and the first week sells... Da -da 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 62,000 units. What? What? That's a 40% drop. I said earlier that this slump is a bit more nuanced than the fall off exhibited by DaBaby, and here's why. First of all, let's not pretend that 62,000 album units is a small number of sales because it's not, but in comparison to a staggering 101,000 first week from his debut, it is a discernible drop off. And the album was pretty much met with, how do I put this, iffy reviews? kinda bad. Critics criticized it or were indifferent to it and fans straight up just did not like that at all. So many people were wondering what went wrong. Well, before we derive our own conclusions, Let's hear it in his own words. Hulu has an original series in partnership with Spotify uh, called Rap Caviar Presents, and one of the episodes just so happens to be about Roddy Rich, titled Roddy Rich, The Gift and the Curse. Unfortunately, I, I don't really have any way of showing you guys the actual footage or interviews from it because I can't exactly record it off of Hulu, uh, and YouTube doesn't seem to have a single clip from it online. So I will do my best to give a play-by-play -play of the narrative being spun in this episode. It starts off with this dramatic text explaining that in February of 2022, Roddy Rich posted a snippet of a new song. And needless to say, people were less than satisfied with how it sounded. It did kind of suck. So Roddy does what any level-headed and non-reactionary person would do and deletes all of his social media. In the show, he says, you know, he's going through it, so fuck it, might as well dip. This is sort of the beginning of the end, and the episode. The world of music social media is kind of like the pre-human Devil Earth from Devil Man Crybaby. Uh, it's a survival of the fittest where only the apex predators make it out alive. And this isn't a personal dig on Roddy, but in that world, deleting your account after your snippet gets dogged on? Dog, you're doggone gone after that. It's a sign of weakness, and people recognize that. If they were flaming you for a snippet, of course they're gonna flame you for, you know, deleting your account afterwards. So the public perception of Roddy is, is now shifting after this initial hiccup. And after a little exposition from Post Malone, I immediately understood the narrative of this show and got a little uneasy, uh, but I continued watching. They start spinning this idea that social media is the lifeblood of any rap artist's career, and without it, they will never really be successful. Now, there is some truth to this, but I think it being the first key point of the episode is a little bit of a bad omen, and I promise, give me a minute, I'll tell you why. The episode shows hate comment after hate comment after hate comment in response to Live Life Fast's rollout, with some of the interviewees citing parasocial relationships and Roddy himself citing a fan need for instant gratification in the music that they listen to. But what does he really mean, instant gratification? Hearing a song and liking it? Roddy Rich makes the point that he's a human being. At the end of the day, if he doesn't want to deal with the hate, he doesn't have to. Which, yeah, that's entirely true and I agree with that. It's a, it's a good point. In, in no way would I expect him or anybody else to engage with such vitriolic criticism. However, for better or for worse, this is how things go when you're a public figure. And when a figure stops being public, they stop being a figure. Title card! I won't do a play-by-play -play of the entire episode. I don't think that's necessary and it's not even really why we're here anyways. But I will sort of try to consolidate the narrative down as efficiently as I can. Rap Caviar insists that this gift and curse of social media sort of makes and breaks artists at seemingly random discretion. TikTok blows up the box and Twitter tears down his sophomore rollout at complete random. Roddy is painted as a victim of dogpiling and unjust hate, which is true. Like I said, he did not deserve that shit. But not once does anybody stop to consider that maybe the album was just bad? People considered his response to criticism reactionary and dramatic and it turned fans against him because they thought that it was distasteful and a little bit annoying. About 20 minutes into the episode, they actually reference it as a sophomore slump. Hey, 
That was my idea. I just don't feel like they explore every reason why. Remember how I mentioned that Pinkerton was the example of a certain dynamic between artist and audience? This is kind of similar. If people don't already love your newest music, when they see or hear certain reactions that in their eyes are combatant in nature, they will solidify those opinions about the art. Enjoying Please Excuse Me for Being Antisocial does not really equate to allegiance to Roddy on future projects, and this rollout proved that. So rap caviar, I like your playlist a lot, but this narrative is disingenuous because it never really once considers that the poor reception and low sales of Live Life Fast might have had something to do with the quality of the music and even a series of bad PR decisions. It wasn't 100% the result of hate. Did Roddy deserve the hate he got? One more time? No, of course not, but I do think it's a bit shallow to conflate the hate with the album not selling. That's just one gear in a pretty massive machine. But also, I empathize with that struggle, especially as somebody who has a complicated relationship with social media. As you can see, you know, I've you know, built a platform on social media and I rely on it heavily to build this brand around my content. But I also wish that I could disengage with it sometimes and have a much more impersonal relationship with the social media platforms that I operate on. And I get nowhere near the amount of attention that Roddy Rich does. We can talk about how the post ironic and competitively performative zeitgeist of the social media internet breeds anonymous hate and soul sucking sycophants all day. Uh, but my point isn't online hate is bad and causes sophomore slumps. That's not what I'm saying. I guess what I'm saying is what I said at the beginning of this section. Album rollouts are complicated and every decision made can spawn a series of butterfly effects that can either have incredibly positive or devastating outcomes down the line. Sometimes mixing together half-assed songs and lackluster performances with knee-jerk reactions in a competitive online space can cause trouble for an album's release down the line. It happens, we've seen it. And the denial of these factors being in play can only further harm an artistic trajectory that was once viewed as an unstoppable force. Roddy Rich is a talented guy, but I think that him and his team made a series of poor decisions in his music and his PR, and it had some pretty detrimental effects on his career. Could you simply say, the album was bad, so it performed poorly? Yeah, sure, I wouldn't tell you that you're wrong, but, but I do think it's more than that. And that's not to be entirely dismissive of Rap Caviar's message that the episode is trying to get across, uh, because one thing that they get entirely correct is how it is very difficult to be an artist without engaging on social media in some capacity, especially if you aren't already an established presence in the industry. Kendrick can post once a year. I cannot. And unfortunately, as we all know, social media is a breeding ground for some pretty harsh opinions, whether it is, you know, scathing and calculated reviews or hateful lunacy. But it can have a huge impact on the mental health of an artist with millions of eyes on them. So I don't want to in any way dismiss the impact that that year had on Roddy Rich's mental health. In the show, it really did seem to bother him a lot, and he didn't deserve that. But the album was not good, and it was a textbook sophomore slump, so I wanted to break down why I thought things happened the way they did. Another thing that they got right is social media can truly make an artist an overnight sensation. Let's talk about that. Remember how I dismissed the downfall of DaBaby earlier as a talking point because it didn't quite fit the specific parameters that I had set for the video and how that seemed to be an important boundary that I maintain? Well, I'm a liar. Kind of. If Pinkerton was the ghost of sophomore slump past and Live Life Fast was the ghost of sophomore slump present, then I guess what we're about to talk about is the ghost of sophomore slump future. Being, as you may have guessed, the sophomore slumps that haven't happened yet. This is fairly difficult territory to venture into because in a way we're sort of predicting the crime before it happens, and I'm going to try to explain where I think the concept of a sophomore slump is headed in the near future. Because the music industry is a rapidly changing mosaic of influence and structure, the way things functioned even a decade or two ago from now is, is beyond antiquated. I know this is a bit of a low hanging fruit, but in 2022, a total of 33 million CDs were shipped out, uh, and in 2000, a total of 940. 40 million chipped out. The difference between almost a billion CDs shipped in a year and only 30 million is pretty monumental. And although you may be saying, well, duh, yeah, no one needs CDs anymore or even owns a CD player. Yeah, that's my point. Trends like these have ripple effects. And so viewing the trends, you can kind of sort of loosely jump to conclusions. In my case, I could, you know, maybe go, streaming services lead to a massive drop in CD sales. CDs were a good way to get an artist's body of work in one purchase you can now get an artist's entire discography from their Spotify page. It is no longer imperative to group songs together in annual, semi-annual projects. 
are full albums even really necessary to succeed anymore? I love the experience of listening to an album in full, but for new artists trying to get their foot in the door in 2024, why should they prioritize dropping an album all at once if one viral single can get them playing music festivals the same year? Seriously. Do we even need albums anymore? To me, this is a silly question. Yeah, my very favorite music experiences come from albums as a specific facet of the art form of music, and in no way do I think that the concept should be or will ever be phased out. But from a logistical perspective, especially when trying to capitalize on more mainstream and wider demographics, you could argue that it's maybe not the most viable business model anymore. Dozens of artists have gotten their big break, not from an album drop, but from an explosive level of virality surrounding a single single track or even only a portion of a song. We all saw the Steve Lacey concert videos. People just don't have favorite songs anymore. They have favorite parts of songs. The smallest measurement of how we quantify music has changed. It's like if one day we just decided to shorten the plank length. So what does that mean for the longest way to quantify music? I hate to get on YouTube and be like, oh, TikTok bad, uh, but, but it and other new ways to consume media have cultivated a new blueprint for success and the dynamic has shifted. Why should artists put potential years years worth of effort and energy and money into an album that might succeed when they can post a new snippet once a week and just wait for one of them to take off and finish that song. Sure, it's not very fun, but it's a shortcut and a sacrifice of integrity that many artists view as beneficial or almost entirely necessary to succeed in the music industry that they want to be a part of. And in a way, in subscribing to this promotional philosophy, you can almost circumvent the potential of a sophomore slump happening because you're never bothering with a sophomore album. The land landscape of music has changed. Huge announcements happen on Instagram Live, and artists with four songs out have 10 million monthly listeners, and Obama listens to Mitski. It's getting crazy out there. So, is the sophomore slump dying? My answer is kind, kind of, kind of? I think that the term sophomore slump itself carries a varying level of impact in its usage depending on who you're applying to. Mainstream pop and rap are going to be hit the hardest by this because these albums are one, getting the most attention, and two, getting the most attention from people that aren't listening to the music. There's so much more open discourse on an album like Live Life Fast than maybe a more fringe or niche band's sophomore album, so the term sophomore slump carries more weight if it poses an actual threat to your social standing as a major star. The bigger they are, the harder they fall, I guess. And a new generation of aspiring industry-safe pop artists and rock bands are hardly worried about full-length projects at all because that's just not the meta anymore. Like I said earlier, the album will never die. I think it's silly to think that it will. Even in this new age of formulaically catchy and lowest common denominator factory produced music. Because although that's the music that gets the most attention or discussion around it, thousands upon thousands of artists and bands aren't really worried about that methodical of a presence. So moving forward as a modern concept, the sophomore slump as a curse really only has as much importance and mystique as we give it, it's not like the looming threat that it once was. As music becomes more accessible and the dynamic of how we consume music changes, industry boogeymen like the sophomore slump become less of a problem for many potential reasons. Artists don't drop as many albums anymore. Higher accessibility means a much higher portion of an audience that is more forgiving to mediocrity. It's easier to bounce back from a weak project. You don't need to worry about album sales because one popular song from an album is all it takes to have security. It's gotten rather complicated. And if somebody's second album is bad, it's unfortunate, but we move on. I do think that the sophomore slump is very much alive as a concept, but I think in today's environment, it poses less of a threat to crumpling a career because, you know, although it's always possible, there are other avenues to take if your initial endeavors don't exactly succeed. And I think that's what it comes down to, the ability to go against the industry standard that we set decades ago with physical media and music being in a much more restricted medium for both artist and audience. If the seemingly antiquated format of one album every one or two years isn't the way you want to do things, that's a totally viable option. You don't have to. So as this dynamic changes, so do things like the sophomore slump. Every generation feels this way in some way, uh, but I feel like we're on the brink of a new age of how we consume music. Accessibility is at an all time high, risk taking is more viable, and the capacity for something to have an audience has expanded exponentially. Is the sophomore slump going to stick around? Yeah, probably, but maybe not in the way that we recognize it today. Our demand for constant satiation doesn't facilitate an environment in which aspiring mainstream talent feels like it needs to even subscribe to that format. And a decade or two down the line, I'm sure we'll throw our heads back in the air and laugh at the outdated streaming models that we use today. At the end of the day, if you make a second album, uh, just make sure your second album doesn't suck. I've been Mel and you've been great. Thanks for watching.